I'm Hanish Patel and this is User Friendly, the show where we explore emerging trends in tech, media and telecom and how they impact business, operations and the world around you. Companies today are being challenged to translate the need for diversity and inclusion into impactful actions and meaningful conversation. While most business leaders believe having a diverse and inclusive culture is critical to performance, they don't always know how to achieve it. Today, we're discussing inclusion in the workplace, specifically in tech companies, and what individuals and businesses are doing to implement a positive change. Joining me on this episode of User Friendly are Julia Silva, Diversity Program Specialist at Google, and Sharon Harris, VP of Alliance Relationships for Google Marketing Platform at Deloitte. Julia, Sharon, welcome to the show. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Excited awesome. to be here. I could not be more excited about what we're going to cover today. This is such a hot topic, such an important topic. So let's just dive straight into it, right? Diversity and inclusion programs are not a new thing, that's for sure. So what does it mean in the workplace today, though? So something that, that has recently come about and, and changed from the initial inception of diversity and inclusion is this addition of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and it's really important that we don't use these words interchangeably because they mean different things, right? So diversity is the differences and variations within a group. Really important that it's within a group. An individual cannot be diverse, and I hear that all the time, and it drives me nuts. It's within a group context. Um, and then equity is really getting at the difference between equity equity and equality. So equality aims for fairness, but it can only work if everyone starts from the same place and that if everyone has kind of the same needs and needs the same type of help. And so equity is really giving everyone the tools needed to succeed. And so I wanted to call that distinction out because I think it's something that's new and it's really becoming much more uh, prevalent in this type of work. Um, and then inclusion is the piece of, do people feel included? Do they have that, that seat at the table? So that's something that has been a recent kind of shift, I think, in the dialogue is looking at it in terms of diversity, equity and inclusion. I'm glad you brought up equity because we're all going to experience it differently. But how do we all have the same tools in order to you know, find solutions, to overcome challenges or to just even have a voice at the table? And equity is so critical. I think it's really about, you know, driving that additional awareness to those individual experiences and understanding, OK, we may need to do something different in order to drive equity for this individual or this group of people versus another group of people. Yeah, and I think there's been a shift in how it's being perceived in the sense that diversity is one thing and inclusion is another right. and making sure to educate on the importance of both. And, and I always like to use the phrase, you know, diversity is being invited to the party, but inclusion is being asked to dance, right? So there's this idea of we need to to focus on having a more representative workplace, but also when we get those people to your organization, to your company, do they feel included? Do they feel that they have the same tools, the same uh, career growth opportunities, leadership potential? You know, are they actually being included so that they want to stay. I think that's really important to to note the differences because there's a lot of efforts and we're all, you know, at least in tech and at Google specifically, we're really working hard to have a more representative workforce. However, we have another team that's solely focused on the inclusion aspect and that idea of we want to retain those people once they actually arrive. And so that's something with this, this conversation, diversity and inclusion, it's really important to note those two parallel paths, but it's all towards that same goal of really making a great culture for everyone. That's such a great point when you bring up inclusion, because at the end of the day, in order to really be successful, you have to have these differing viewpoints and everyone has to feel empowered to share their ideas, to share their voice and to really be a part of the decision making. Inclusion is that next level up that companies are really aspiring toward because it's about, you know, do we have the right representatives at the table? Does everyone feel empowered to share their ideas? And it's an interesting conversation because inclusion is something I think here at Deloitte that we are 
making a lot of strides around. We certainly, like every other company out there, have a lot more work to do, but I'm really proud of the efforts that we're making and the strides that we're taking to really build a truly inclusive culture. You know, I really love what you said there earlier, Julia, about kind of being invited to the party and then being asked to dance. And if I may use that analogy of kind of what you said, Sharon, I think that influence, I'd go one further, is we actually got the ability to change the music, mm. right? To <laughs> use that analogy. And I think that's the power of, if I've understood it correctly in terms of what you're talking about from an inclusion perspective as being that step above of just not just talking about diversity. You know, given that growing recognition that we talked about, that, that you've both talked about in terms of the criticality of diversity as well as inclusion and the impact naturally that that's going to have on business performance as a whole, because ultimately companies, organizations are still going to say, well, how does that benefit the bottom line? How is this going to change us as a company and involve us as a company? What challenge you think lies there when you're thinking about translating that into value and impactful actions? What can companies do and change in their workplace to make that happen? So we actually, we talk about this a lot in our I Am Remarkable program uh, about how diversity is no longer a nice to have. This is business critical at this point and there's tremendous business value that can come from these types of efforts. So I Am Remarkable is an initiative that really focuses on empowering women and underrepresented groups to learn the skills necessary to self-promote in the workplace, but really in every aspect of your life. And within that, we're also trying to challenge the social perception around gender modesty and what it means to self-promote specifically for women, because there is a social perception that it's seen in a negative way. And we've seen that self-promotion is a, a skill that's needed for your professional development. Um, and so the way that the, the initiative actually works works is we host a 90 minute workshop and in that workshop we go through the program itself how it started the research behind it as to why self-promotion is really important and then we go into an exercise and I will say that it started back in 2015 and I think at the end of 2016 we had about 200 participants as of I think today we've had nearly 35,000 participants, mm -hmm. specifically in regards to the I Am Remarkable workshops. We also want to make sure that you are able to control that narrative and showcase that unique value that you bring to the table. And within that, organizations over time will start to realize, well, I need to invest in these individuals. I need to continue to grow and, and expand in their professional development. But you have a bit of onus in that as well. I think that's something that's really powerful is I taking the opportunity to showcase me, Julia, I am remarkable for all of these accomplishments, all of these things that I've done. It's going to continue to, to benefit my organization. And then there are true business implications to why we need to support these, these communities. Companies with more women board directors outperform others by 53%. Like there's statistical information that shows having more women at the table, we get things done when we have those leadership positions and we help companies overperform. Uh, there's also a statistic that shows that companies that are in the top quartile for racial and ethnic diversity, they have 35% higher financial returns than the national median. So from a numbers standpoint, there's proof that as to why diversity is important. And it's not just money, numbers, you know, we want to continue to grow and and as an organization, but it's also Google is a global company. Right. So let's just take a step back. We're a global company. We have a global consumer base. How are we going to continue to innovate and develop products for a global consumer base if we ourselves aren't representative of that community? And so it goes into this idea that diversity allows you to be more flexible, more creative, more innovative, right? You're able to have more perspectives at the table that you're going to continue to build great products. And that's a, a fundamental aspect of, of Google that I'm super proud of to be a part of is that we truly want to build for everyone, but we also want to make sure that we're representative of who we're building for. I, I think when we think about business impact, there's just a fundamental reality about the demographics of the universe. They're changing. And you know, many of the groups that we consider today to be underrepresented, uh, ethnic groups and women are becoming a larger percentage of the population. Therefore, your consumer base for any company, any brand out there is changing. So how do you market? How do you message to that audience? How do you grow that audience so that they are 
one, find value in your product. They, they are continually spending with you. You know, the numbers, yes, they definitely do matter uh, because business is still business. But if you're going to be successful, you have to have a culture and business practices that are not only representative of your consumers, they're respectful of your consumers, and ultimately they're relevant to your consumers. Without having those voices, those faces, and those people at the table when you're conceiving of products, when you're developing products, when you're testing products, you're going to miss because the experience across all of these spectrums is very different. You know, how I see something as a black woman versus a Latina versus an Asian woman versus an Asian man are very different. And the things that we find in our, you know, daily lives, whether it's, you know, picking up our kids from school or the groceries that we buy or the products that we need most, there are nuances and subtleties that you're not going to pick up unless someone was at the table when that product was being developed and said, hey, this is name choice doesn't work or this commercial is going to, you know, offend someone. That's the importance of having that representation at the table. But once again, it's, you've got to have representation. You've got to be respectful. You've got to be relevant. That's the real business impact of having a diverse and inclusive culture. Let's double click into that. I mean, there's so many companies in the tech space, even our own. You've got all these resource groups, you've got industry councils. Are they moving that needle forward to being represented at the table? Or are those resource groups and those councils trying to achieve something different within the organization? Well, the idea is that everyone needs to have a personal experience with someone who's other than. And this allows for much more dynamic conversations. It allows for greater understanding and it provides a truly safe and open environment to have those discussions. I don't expect everyone to understand everything about everyone. Until you've had a conversation with someone who may be from a different part of the world than you, who has different beliefs than you, it's gonna be very difficult for you to find that understanding. And certainly in the world that we live in today, you know, I'm a big believer in open dialogue. We have to have those conversations. I think also for us at Deloitte, inclusion councils have been helpful in terms of highlighting and spotlighting that talent that may not have been noticed. You know, Julia touched upon, you know, often women aren't speaking up for themselves. This is often the case in many other groups where culturally it's not the norm to be so vocal or bodacious in your mm -hmm. conversation. So this allows, once again, for a really comfortable environment for those moments of coaching and sponsorship to really occur that often open the doors for other opportunities. Uh, and I think for us, we're, we're continuing to grow our inclusion councils and we're just finding really, really good success in that effort. But, you know, this is not a journey of a single day. This is something that has been created over years and years, and it's going to take a lot of additional work and more time until we really start to see and benefit from all those changes. So, I, I love that Deloitte also does the inclusive councils we do as well at Google. And we do have employee resource groups that I think I just wanted to highlight the the experience I've personally had with being a part of a few of the different ERG groups. So I am half Brazilian, half Portuguese. So my dad is from the northeast of Brazil. My mom is from Portugal. I'm the first person in my family born in the U.S. So I have a very unique identity in the sense that I really don't fit into one category. I'm always the other. And I felt this way for you know, as long as I can remember. And uh, something that's interesting for me with how I've come to leverage and utilize the, the ERGs is just that sense of community where I'm able to find someone who's had my similar lived experience and that connection. It, it, it's so rare, especially with my unique combination. But we have you know, women at group, we have our familia at group, uh, we have our black Googler network. All of these are focused on that idea of community building because we all have our own lived experiences. And sometimes you just want to have that person you can connect with who's had that similar background or similar experience as you. And one of the nice things about Google is there's a lot of overlap. So we do kind of have uh, multiple cross ERG gatherings where everyone can kind of share, you know, what are some of the experiences that you're going through now and how can we help one another? I think that idea of allyship is really important as well is understanding how can I uplift 
someone's voice that maybe isn't being heard. You're, you're what you said about kind of being in the room, and and if there's um, if you notice that someone isn't at the table, being that person to say, hey, I'm going to assess this space, and I notice that there maybe isn't representation of this individual. We don't have this perspective at the at the table. We should bring this up. Open dialogue is really key, and I think that the allyship between all of the different ERG groups is something that's really phenomenal and it just continues to build on this idea like we all need to have a stake in this we all need to to push this forward it can't just be you know on the on the backs of those who who are underrepresented it really needs to be a collective so I want to go into an area that you touched upon about Google being global Deloitte global as well right and you've got the I am remarkable the hashtag how does that transfer internationally mm. And I'd love to, to hear how that can be different cultures, even the translation of that. How does that articulate to different cultures? And you talked about your background in itself. Yeah, that's a great question. So I'll give a little context on I'm Remarkable just so that everyone understands how it started. Uh, so it started back in 2015 as a 20% project. So one of Google's infamous 20% projects where you can dedicate 20% of your time outside of your core role towards a passion area, a side project. Uh, Gmail is an example of a 20% project. And, and so I'm Remarkable started by two women named Anna in our London offices. And so this actually started in EMEA. And over time, based on doing a few pilots, we really started that this idea of self-promotion and A, just bringing awareness to the fact that this is something that a lot of people struggle with, but also B, trying to challenge the social perception around what it means to self-promote. They realized that this is not just something for EMEA. And so they wanted to span, expand this globally. And so since 2015, we have scaled tremendously. We are now in the US, we're in Latin America, APAC. We recently just did our International Women's Day summits and we featured I'm Remarkable across 12 global summits. And in that experience, that same question came up is how does this translate in different cultures and different countries? And I think the, the concept, like I Am Remarkable, it absolutely resonates. But it's really critical to to be mindful of the fact that there are cultural expectations that come into play that will make it much more challenging for certain individuals to do this skill. For example, I uh, was working with our team in Tokyo and the cultural expectation for women in Japan to be modest is much more heavily defended there. And so it's even you know, another step that you have to to take to change the perception around what it means to just talk about your accomplishments. We're just talking about, you know, things that we're proud of. But you look at Japan versus the US. In the US it's a little it's a little easier in the sense that being more open and being very forthcoming and very passionate and uh, leadership skills are always really welcomed. You have to look at the differences between those cultures. And I do think that it still resonates, but we're doing a lot of work in making it more localized. So we actually recently just got uh, translations in Portuguese and Japanese. We're working on translations in Russian so that we can have this more specialized for each location. But I do think that the overall concept absolutely resonates with everyone. But it is something that, and I'm very mindful of this, you always need to consider where you are and the environment to make sure that we're being respectful of those cultural differences. And the, the great thing uh, recently, I went to to Brazil for our International Women's Day Summit there, and we did an I'm Remarkable session. And it was the first time I heard it in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. And I speak Portuguese fluently, so it was really exciting for me just to see the differences and how it's translated, right? So I am remarkable there. They say, eu sou foda. And that basically means like, I'm the shit. Love like it. I'm, like, <laughs> that's how love it's translated. It. I love that one. And it's so, it, and it, it worked so well <laughs> because the women in that audience were just so excited to be there. And I could just feel the energy of mm -hmm. you're just like, I, I am the shit. I know that I am incredible. I do this work. And, and it was just, it was great to, kind of step outside of that US lens, right? I finally kind of mm -hmm. got to see it in a different culture. But again, everyone still got a lot of, out of the exercise. They still left the workshop saying, wow, I didn't realize I had such a hard time talking about myself. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. But then also you leave feeling so empowered, right? And that's a, that's a great, like, 
shows how translating something sometimes is a little better in a different language, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that. I have to use that. That's the hashtag of the yeah, day. I the am one. the shit. Exactly. I love it, Julia. I love it. <laughs> so when I think about diversity and inclusion, I think you, you both have touched upon that. It's not just about women. It's not just about the benefit of women. It's about the benefit of everybody. And, and what's the role that we can all play? And in particular, I'm going to sort of click in here and say, particularly when it comes to men, what's the role that we can play? And if you think about our listeners, how can they really get involved if they're not quite sure? Yeah, absolutely. And I know with, with I Am Remarkable, so the program actually started originally for women only, but when we started to do pilots, we realized men absolutely can benefit from this. I've done sessions where I had a 50-50 split men-women, and the men actually came up to me afterwards and they said, thank you. I didn't realize that I also struggled with this, and I didn't realize that these were the experiences of women in the workplace, because we actually go through a lot of research during this, this workshop that kind of describes the experiences of women in underrepresented groups in the workplace. And I think it's just that the awareness and that education, because oftentimes there's a bit of a gap and men, you know, will say, I don't know how to be helpful, but then there's this kind of uh, hesitation to, to start yeah. or to, to just go and, and start to learn. And I think the biggest thing is really just show up, be open to, to listening and learning, um, but also kind of self-educate because you can't really expect everyone to always want to, you know, share their experiences and, and have to, to educate again. I, I I use this term of you can't have this the burden on those who are minoritized. Absolutely. Given what both of you covered, there's there's just so much material here that we've covered. Usually I'd have some closing remarks and I don't even know where to begin. And something we can all be doing to, to use the analogy of let's be inviting more people to the party. Yeah. Let's be asking them to dance and let's give them the opportunity to change the music. I absolutely want to thank the both of you. Julia, Sharon, thank you for joining me today on such an important topic so thank you ever so much and until next time happy listening thank you thank you for having me thanks for listening to user friendly to subscribe or listen to more episodes search for deloitte user friendly in your favorite podcatcher or find us online at userfriendly.deloitte.com the opinions expressed by guests on this podcast belong to them and do not necessarily affect those of deloitte